So good afternoon. It's uh, four o'clock in Central Europe, and I welcome you to uh, this last session on environment and meteorology. My name is Dirk Schäfer from Eurocontrol, and I will be your session chair. We have uh, three speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, Antonio Franco, Emir Ganic, and Eulalia Hernandez Romero, who will present in term. We have two uh, presentations who will be pre-recorded and one presentation live. Um, you can use the uh, Q&A functionality, please, in order to post your questions. Please don't use the chat for that. Use the Q&A functionality uh, directly. And please uh, type uh, short questions. Don't write a whole paragraph. Just a question so I can read it out to the speakers. Um, we will start with uh, the first presentation, a probabilistic storm avoidance concept for en route flight. And the uh, paper uh, will be presented by Antonio Franco. Antonio is an assistant professor at the Aerospace Engineering Department at the University of Seville, um, where he works with Damian Rivas and uh, some other colleagues. Uh, the floor is yours, Antonio. We will listen to your video and then we'll get you some questions. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. This is Antonio Franco from the University of Seville, and I will introduce you to a probabilistic storm avoidance concept for en route flight that we, the University of Seville, along with METSOL, have developed, implemented, and assessed. Before we get started, I would like to thank the CSAR Innovation Days Program Committee for deeming this contribution to be worth it to be here today. So, why a probabilistic storm avoidance concept? Well, it is very well known that weather has an important impact on ATM in general and on aircraft operations in particular. In fact, thunderstorms pose serious hazards to aviation and any attempt to forecast their motion will be affected by uncertainty. The main thing we can do to deal with that risk is to avoid the thunderstorms but we think it would be better if we took that uncertainty into account in the storm avoidance process. The underside of the storm avoidance is that the diversions required worsen flight efficiency and environmental impact and increases the flight crew workload. Furthermore, in convective scenarios, the workload of air traffic controllers rises both because the traffic becomes irregular and difficult to anticipate and because there is less available airspace. Therefore, talking, taking all this into account, the overall objective of this piece of research is the development, implementation and assessment of a concept for probabilistic storm avoidance, we call it PSA, capable of generating avoidance routes that take into account the uncertainty of a storm cells. Thus, the PSA concept envisions the integration of enhanced meteorological capabilities, namely ground-based probabilistic forecasts of the storm evolution, referred to as probabilistic nowcasts. They will have a larger coverage area than on board weather radar, of course, and also will contain information about uncertainty. Thanks to the integration of these new meteorological capabilities, PSA concept is expected to have a twofold impact. On the one hand, PSA will enable the anticipation of the avoidance maneuvers, leading to more predictable and safer deviations and therefore a decrease in the subsequent tactical interventions. On the other hand, it will enable a more active role of controllers in the storm avoidance process, as I will outline by the end of the presentation. I'm glad to say that this piece of research has been performed within the PSA MED project probabilistic weather avoidance routes for medium-term storm avoidance. This is a catalyst project funded by CSR Engage KTN within the thematic challenge 3, efficient provision and use of meteorological information in ATM. We have already said that PSA concept needs the probabilistic nowcast as input. Although there are several mature initiatives, for instance steps, such an advanced product is currently under development by meteorological agencies. Hence, in this work, we have devised a statistical procedure that takes a deterministic nowcast as input and provides an ensemble nowcast. 
To understand what a probabilistic nowcast or nowcast ensemble is, first we have to know what a deterministic nowcast is. The three main pillars of a storm cell nowcasting are observation, storm identification and extrapolation. Observation is usually based on radar data and or satellite data, sometimes in combination with wind data. As for the identification, some nowcasts it identifies storms as objects in the current radar image by extracting polygonal areas that exceed a certain reflectivity threshold. Then, the motion of the storms is determined based on past radar images and extrapolated to some future instant sampling times or analysis times in our context. Obtaining a set of frames, also called messages. Each frame includes a set of storm cells characterized by the geometry and location. Some of the nowcasts swap the other of the two last activities. They perform the extrapolation from the raw radar image and then they perform the identification at each sampling time. Nevertheless, the result is the same a set of, let's say, M frames, and each frame including a set of storm cells characterized by the geometry and location. In this work we consider an Alcast mix aviation from the Deutsche Wetterdienst as a deterministic Nowcast. It has a spatial resolution of 1 km by 1 km, a time step of 5 minutes, and a lead time of 60 minutes, with what implies that they provide 13 frames, one observation plus 12 extrapolations. The information is updated every 5 minutes, so every 5 minutes you can have a complete new deterministic forecast. As per the ensemble nowcast, we must recall that this is a set of deterministic nowcasts. Each one of them is called ensemble member and represents a possible meteorological future outcome. The ensemble nowcast integrates information about the nowcast uncertainty. Indeed, the uncertainty is in the spread of the ensemble members. To generate it, we followed the path already started in a previous SSR funded research project called Tibiomet. In particular, we perform a random perturbation of the position of the storm cells predicted by the deterministic forecast. To do so, we assume, on the one hand, that the main source of uncertainty is in the location of the individual storm cells and on the other hand that the displacement errors are independent Gaussian random variables whose standard deviations increase with the look-ahead time according to the empirical laws proposed by Manuela Sauer et Alter here at the SASAR Innovation Days in 2014. How have we implemented the probabilistic storm avoidance concept devised? Well, it is based on the addition of new functionalities to an already existing deterministic storm avoidance tool. Hence, it is a flexible concept, as any deterministic storm avoidance tool could be used. In particular, we have relied on the use of DivMet, so the resulting PSA tool is called DivMet-P. The required input for the event P is composed of a reference trajectory, the wind and temperature fields, a probabilistic nowcast or ensemble nowcast, and a risk level value, which is an adjustable parameter intended to define the avoidance strategy. The output is a probabilistic avoidance trajectory, which is a single trajectory obtained for a given risk level value. The event P performs the following four steps. It computes the hazardous weather regions, it calculates the risk field, it computes the risk field isolines, and finally it applies the deterministic avoidance tool, they've met in this case. Let's see what it is obtained step by step. To do so, we have chosen an illustrative example consisting in a 60-minute segment of a reference route between a given initial point and a final point. The initial time has been taken equal to the prediction time at which one has an NCMA deterministic forecast. Here we can see the polygons of thunderstorm cells at the prediction time in blue and at the subsequent sampling times in red. Then the ensemble of nowcasts is generated according to the procedure explained before. 
A total of 100 members have been generated and jointly depicted in the left figure for the sampling time TP plus 20 minutes. In the right figure, one has only the ensemble member number 50, also at the sampling time TP plus 20 minutes. A close comparison of both pictures gives a clear impression of the uncertainty in the location of the storm cells at that forecast sampling time. Up to now we are explaining the case study and the input considered. Now we are going to see what we get at each step of the, prob step of the probabilistic storm avoidance tool. First, for, the, for each Naukast ensemble member, for instance the number 50, and each Naukast sampling time, for instance, for instance TP plus 20 minutes, the hazardous weather regions are computed by extending all the storm cells with a safety margin, so we end up with n being the number of ensemble members, by m being the number of sampling times, pieces of information like this one. Afterwards, DevMedP computes for each Naukas sampling time the risk field. This is the probability that a given location will be affected by adverse weather. It requires first defining a space desolation and second computing the percentage of ensemble members forecasting a grid tile being covered by a certain weather region. In this step, we get m pieces of information like this, as many as forecast sampling times or analysis time. The, the next step is to obtain the risk field isolines or level curves that correspond to the given risk level value. The resulting curves are taken as the boundaries of the regions to be avoided by the deterministic storm avoidance tool. This is performed for each NARC sampling time leading to having m pieces of information like this one. In other words, one has a time-evolving description of the no-fly regions, which is strongly depending on the risk level value considered to compute them. Here we see the risk field isolate for TP plus 20 minutes and three risk level values, 10% in red, 50% in blue and 90% in magenta. One can see that the lower the risk level value the larger the regions to be avoided. Finally, the deterministic avoidance tool, DivMet, is applied to obtain the corresponding avoidance route, which circumvents the no-fly regions and reattaches to the given reference trajectory. As we said before, this probabilistic avoidance route is a unique planned route for a given risk level value. If one changes the risk level value, the route is accordingly changed. In fact, the risk level value is expected to have an important effect on the route, so it is essential to reach a trade-off between underreacting and overreacting to the uncertain meteorological information. As an illustration, we can see here the resulting routes in the case study for a 50% risk level value and a 90% risk level value along with the risk field isolines at TP plus 20 minutes and we can see this effect of increasing with lower risk level value and decreasing with higher risk level values considered. Once the PSA concept has, was developed and implemented we addressed its assessment. The objective of the concept assessment was twofold on the one hand, we wanted to study the effects of the risk level on the probabilistic weather avoidance routes, and on the other hand, we sought to evaluate the costs and benefits resulting from the aircraft following this avoidance routes. In particular, we focused on flight efficiency, safety and workload. For each flight, we have four trajectories. First, the reference trajectories. This is the originally planned all, uh, trajectory, this is a datum. Then we have probabilistic avoidance trajectory. This is the planned trajectory generated by the MET-P with the ensemble now cast and intended to replace the reference trajectory. Then we have the executed reference trajectory. This is the trajectory that the aircraft actually follows when it is subject to the actual weather 
and the reference trajectory is planned. It is generated by using DeepMed and the actual storm cells evolution not an outcast. Fourth, we have the executed avoidance trajectory. This is the trajectory that the aircraft actually follows when it is subject to the actual weather and the probabilistic avoidance trajectory is planned. It is generated by using DeepMed and the actual storm cells evolution, not a now cast. The assessment was based on simulation, so we defined a simulation scenario consisting of a real heavy storm episode plus a synthetic traffic generated so that each reference trajectory would encounter a storm cell. The problem was solved for three different risk level values 10, 50 and 90%. In this picture, we can see the whole set of reference trajectories considered and the now cast coverage area. As indicators, we defined first the percentage of avoidance trajectories different from the corresponding reference trajectories, second, the average number of tactical deviations per flight, which is related to the safety and workload of pilots and controllers, and third, the difference in the arrival times between the executed avoidance trajectory and the executed reference trajectories, which is related to the efficiency. Finally, the results obtained are summarized in a couple of slides. In the table of the left, one has how many avoidance trajectories are different from the corresponding reference trajectories. The percentage values are quite large in all cases, given the idea of a very demanding traffic scenario. This number decrease as the risk level increase, since the no-fly regions become smaller. In the table of the right, the average number of tactical deviations per flight is shown for aircraft following the avoidance and the reference routes. The number of deviations for high values of the risk level are very similar to today's practice, but they are smaller for medium and small risk level values. Notice that Although the number of deviations per flight is not improved for high risk level values, these deviations are indeed smaller, as we will see in the following table. Now, in the table on the left, one has the differences in arrival times between executed trajectory and planned trajectories. This constitutes a measure of the magnitude of the tactical deviations needed. A positive value means that the aircraft arrives later than planned, so a larger value means a larger tactical deviation. One can see that following the probabilistic avoidance route substantially reduces the magnitude of the subsequent tactical deviations in average, even for high-risk level values and also its prediction uncertainty, as the variance also decreases. Therefore, combining results from the second table and the third table, one can conclude that, by following the probabilistic avoidance routes, the safety of the flights and the workload of the pilots and controllers can be improved. Less tactical deviations are required and the remaining deviations are smaller, facilitating the work in the cockpit and the coordination with ATC. The last table shows the differences in arrival times between executed avoidance trajectories and executed reference trajectories. A positive difference means that the aircraft would arrive later to its destination if it is executed if it executed the probabilistic avoidance route instead of the reference route. One can see that there is a small loss of efficiency for executing the probabilistic avoidance trajectory, which decreases as the risk level value increases. As conclusions, I would say that with the probabilistic storm avoidance concept, we have made a step ahead of the state of the art, because nowadays the storm avoidance is based on deterministic now casting, and deviations and delays caused by storms are just tactically generated. Furthermore, integrating the uncertainty in the storm avoidance process improves situational awareness and therefore enables anticipated and better informed decision making. In fact, with our trajectories, weather related deviations and re delays are anticipated, which leads to safety and workload improvements 
at a small cost of flight efficiency. It is clear that further improvements are needed to grant acceptability by pilots and ATCOs, such as including common airline policies to avoid storms and constraints in deviation so as not to enter into active airspace restrictions or adjacent sectors. One of the most interesting next steps is the development of a medium-term storm avoidance tool, MTSA, based on PSA concept. MTSA would allow uh, traffic controllers to be involved with a more active role in the storm avoidance process. How? Well, the MTSA tool will detect flights predicted to run into storm cells in the next 20 minutes, warn the ATCOs and support them to determine an appropriate avoidance route for each flight. This route will be offered to the pilots. Nevertheless, the MTSA tool is intended to complement, not replace, the current practice so the pilots will always have the last word. MTSA tool will balance workload of tactical and planning tasks in air traffic control, enhancing sector team efficiency and providing a safer and better service to airspace users. And that's it. Many thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much uh, for this interesting presentation, uh, Antonio, very clear. Um, we have time for a few questions and perhaps to kick it off, um, I have one I'd like to ask myself and it is that uh, if I understand right, you are building the uh, ensemble uh, uh, based on existing uh, ensemble members, such as the one that uh, the Deutsche Wetterdienst is, is providing and then you're varying them in order to generate your ensemble. Um, are there also exist, you, you, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that under development, are there are uh, ensemble now that, that are being developed. Um, are you planning in, in future uh, steps of your work to integrate such existing or being developed um, members uh, now cast uh, ensembles? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, we have a, a kind of a follow-up project, which is a FMP Met project, and in fact, we're we're using this this probabilistic storm avoidance concept in FMP Met project. But in that project, we are relying on a on a an ensemble now cast generated by the Spanish uh, Meteorological Office based on. Uh, one of these mature initiatives to generate ensemble knockers. So yes, uh, we, we are actually going to use that. Okay. Um, there's one question uh, relating to the calculation of controller workload. Can you uh, tell us how you quantify that? Um, uh, we, we made a um, very uh, simplified model in which we consider how how many um, contacts or, or links uh, had to be established. So uh, if you have to perform a, a, a deviation, then the, there has to be a link between the, the pilot and the controller. So knowing the number of um, avoiding or of avoiding trajectories different from the reference trajectories, we have a proxy for the, for the controller's workload. Okay. And then um, another question relates to the, uh, to the risk level that is being calculated. Is there an intuitive interpretation of the risk level, like the accept acceptable uh, level of risk and how, how precisely is the risk, risk level calculated? Well, um, what we do is to um, count how many uh, weather scenarios given by, by the, not the ensemble members of the Nowcast ensemble, how many of them uh, say that you're going to cross a dangerous area. So uh, this is, uh, this is the, con the concept of risk in our context. So the idea is that if only one scenario over 100 says that you're going to cross this area, maybe this can be um, acceptable 
for some pilots so uh, or, or in in some circumstances so um the the our risk level is a kind of uh the acceptable risk that that the the pilots are and and also uh, controllers in charge are are willing to take okay excellent uh, we have one question from uh, chevy prats from upc uh he would like to know how precisely divmat computes the uh, avoidance trajectories are you solving a 2d geometric problem perhaps using a minimum path algorithm such as the dijkstra uh, filter uh, um uh well the the met algorithm what what does is um it performs a kind of uh uh i would say uh sorry i i missed the word uh clustering it it performs a clustering with uh neighboring mm, storms and then what it does is is a they they do some visibility computations and they perform the, the, the shortest path in this uh, uh, possible set of paths. Okay. Um, one question relates to the timeline is, uh, is your approach predominantly um, used in a tactical or, uh, or in a strategic phase? Are you um uh, applying your approach also um during the flight or is it only for uh, usage prior to departure so the, the main application we're we're thinking about is uh, the um mtsa so what we wanted to do is to use this uh probabilistic storm avoidance concept in the medium term storm avoidance tool that we are in, in envisioning so the idea is to use it also during flight, but but with with more um, uh, with a more anticipation than we we do that today. So also in flight. Okay, we have a bunch of people uh, posting their questions into the chat. Can you please go into the Q and A uh, function in order to um, to post the questions? Um, I'll take one from the uh, from the chat uh, though. Um, the question is: Did I understand it correctly that the trajectories generated result in longer flight times than are ch achieved today in operations? And I, when reading your paper, I actually got a little confused when you compare the uh, executed versus the planned trajectory because you're doing yourself a disfavor by by showing that uh, that comparison because the the planned trajectory would never be flown in in actual meteor conditions right so uh, the uh, comparison of the executed avoidance versus the executed reference trajectory is probably the more meaningful uh, comparison but there also there you have shown us a slight increase in the in the flight distance can you comment on that Yes. Um, well, first of all, uh, comparing the executed uh, to with respect to the planned gives us an idea of the magnitude of the deviation. So also gives a, a, an impression that following the, the probabilistic storm, uh, trajectory that we proposed, we are going to be late with respect to planned, or this is obvious, but, but you're going to be uh, more predictable. You're, you're going to deviate less with respect to the planned as compared to what we do today, this, for one part. And, and also, uh, yes, we, we have seen that there is a, um, a, little, a little loss of efficiency, which is quite small for high risk level values. But I think that um, this is not uh, all the ingredients that you have to consider in efficiency. So, so you have also less workload from the point of view of the pilots and the controllers, you have more safety. So um, maybe performing a, a little, I don't know, 15 seconds in, in one hour worse than what we are doing today is worth it because you have another advantages. Okay. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you so much uh, again, Antonio, for this thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation and uh, the good answers to, to all the questions we asked you. Um, we will now move uh, to the uh, second presentation in this session. And the presentation is about dynamic noise maps for Ljubljana Airport. And it will be uh, presented by Emir uh, Ganic. I hope I don't make a fool of, uh, of your family name. Emir is a research associate at the uh, Faculty of Transport and Traffic Engineering uh, in uh, the University of Belgrade. And uh, Emir, the floor is yours. You will present live, right? That's right, Dirk. And uh, you pronounced my last name correctly. So thank you for that. And uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here today and to be able to present you the interesting results from the ANIMA project uh, regarding the dynamics noise maps for Ljubljana Airport. So let me start by introducing my co-authors of this paper, and they are Vico Van Osten and Luis Meliveo from the Anatomy um, Engineering. Emil, you're not sharing your presentation just yet. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. I thought that I put my uh, share screen button, but now I suppose that you can see my screen. And now we're so, rolling. Thank you, Dirk, for, for that. And uh, you can see here the first slide uh, regarding the title of uh, my paper. And these are the authors that I was talking to you about. Nico Van Osten and Luis Meliveo from the Anatec Engineering, Motril, Spain. And then uh, Sonia Yerem from National Institute of Public Health from Ljubljana, Slovenia, where actually our case study is based on. And uh, from Palma de Mallorca, Spain, Tomas Luf and Jose Javier Ramasco. I will try to pronounce it in Spanish, uh, Instituto de Física Interdisciplinar y Sistemas uh, Complejos. Uh, and of course, uh, as Dirk mentioned, I'm coming from the University of Belgrade, Faculty of Transport and Traffic Engineering. And I believe that many of you have visited us during the 2017 when we were the host of the Cesarino Innovation Days. Okay, so. This is the brief agenda for today's presentation. I will be talking to you, uh, to you about the ANIMA project, uh, then explain you the difference between traditional way of calculating noise maps and the ones that we are presenting here in this paper calling dynamic noise maps. And what is the methodology behind it? Then I will present you our case study at Ljubljana Airport and the most interesting results and conclusions. So, ANIMA stands for Aviation Noise Impact Management through Novel Approaches. This is a multidisciplinary project that involves 22 partners from 11 countries, almost uh, more than 70 uh, researchers, and over, over budget is uh, 7.45 million euros. Uh, this project has received findings from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research Innovation Program. It started in uh, September 2017. And since it will last for four years, it will end uh, in the next September if there is no extension due to the COVID crisis. And I encourage you all to visit the ANIMA website provided here and also to subscribe to news uh, so you can see all the interesting outcomes of this project. So uh, at this slide, with this uh, little uh, uh, illustration, I would like to show you actually what is the difference between traditional and dynamic noise maps. As you probably all know, uh, airports with uh, more than 5,000 operations per year need to develop uh, noise maps and to send them to the European Commission, the number of people exposed to noise. But what is actually happening here? Uh, in traditional noise maps, what the all airports are doing uh, now, they calculate noise exposure only at residential locations which means that uh, it is assumed that people are staying at their homes for the whole day, 24 hours. Since this is more likely to be reality that people are going from home to drop off kids at school, to go to work or to have a lunch, then coming back from home doing some uh, grocery shopping or so, something like that. Since we want to acknowledge that such movements exist in the population, then we propose, are proposing dynamic noise maps which, will, uh, which are calculating noise exposure at all of these locations where people spend time. So for that, we need to assess uh, daily mobility patterns of population. And since uh, we currently only know where people live from the census population, we need to develop synthetic population, which is artificial population, since we cannot actually know 
or collect the data for the whole population around the airport where they are at the precise moment during the whole year. So uh, how we do this with the selected population, we, are, uh, we have three ways to do from the census data to collect uh, household travel surveys or uh, by using digital services. Since nowadays we are all leaving our digital traces, digital footprints on the internet by using mobile phones or smartphone applications, social networks. And uh, these are also the ways that we can collect the data about daily, uh, daily mobility patterns of population. In this particular uh, uh, case study, we have used household travel survey combined with the census data. But uh, I would like to share with you information that within the Anima project, there is a research team uh, which has developed a smartphone application called Anima App that uh, can collect the data from the users and uh, combine that those movements of people with the noise levels, uh, which we are actually doing uh, here. So we will use this app to validate our results. And uh, the, this study would be uh, probably finalized uh, in second quarter of the next year. So now when we know the movements of the population, we also need to develop noise contours. And for that, we need, we need noise model. In this particular study, we have used Sondeo software developed by our colleagues from the Anotech Engineering. And you also need for every um, aircraft noise uh, study, you need input data such as air traffic data, uh, meteorological data, also topography, um, topological data. And I encourage all the interested readers to look uh, at this uh, ECHAR document 29 uh, edition four for more information about how to create aircraft noise contours. And then when we have movements and contours, we can calculate uh, our dynamic noise maps. So we need to assess uh, spatial and temporal distribution of people. This means to know in each uh, location, in, in each period of time, how many people are there. And uh, for each location, as I uh, showed at the last slide, uh, what are the no noise levels? And when we have these two, we can estimate the number of uh, people annoyed by noise. So how can we do that? Uh, these are equations. The first one shows the L day, evening, and night noise indicator slightly, uh, slightly changed from the definition of the Directive 2002-49 from the European Commission. What has changed is this parameter here and this here, because with this uh, equation, we actually calculate the L day, evening, night noise levels for each person J. So not for the location as traditionally, uh, assessed in the, in the noise maps, they actually calculate the noise at a facade, at a building. But here we calculate the noise for a person, for actual people. And uh, this time frame here is uh, uh, amount of time person J spent at location L. And here is the noise level, uh, equivalent uh, noise level for that particular hour uh, at particular location L. And we have also used the uh, five decibels addition for the evening operations and 10 decibels more for noise levels at night, as same as the LDEN suggested. And for the two equations below, they are actually also suggested by European Commission uh, for the estimation of the number of people annoyed and highly annoyed by aircraft noise. The difference is in these two thresholds. If, it's, uh, if it is below 37 uh, decibels, uh, L then, then they are not, the people are not annoyed by noise. Also for 42, they are not highly annoyed. We will use this, uh, just remember these two values, we will use it for the uh, other slides. And also we have estimated the number of people who are sleep disturbed and highly sleep disturbed, but that is based on the L night noise indicator presented here. And to show you a little bit about uh, our case study, we have used Ljubljana Jorge Pucnik Airport, which is the busiest and largest international airport in Slovenia, located 20 kilometers northwest from the capital of Slovenia. Uh, this is an airport with a single runway, 3.3 kilometers long, and with a runway 12 and 30. Uh, we used uh, in our case study the data from 2018, and in this year, the airport handled more than 1.8 billion passengers and more than 35,000 aircraft operations. Uh, this is more about our case study. Uh, departure and arrival routes uh, obtained from the open sky. And here are the flight statistics per aircraft type and time of day, uh, courtesy of Ljubljana Airport. 
we have obtained the, the data for each and every operation, what was the aircraft type and the time of departure, time of arrival. So this is some flight statistics presented in the paper. And what we have here is actually an average hourly distribution of aircraft operations for year 2018. I will uh, just slightly zoom here so you can see some average peaks during the day. So for example, the most, uh, uh, the biggest number of operations was uh, during the seven, uh, seven, uh, five and six PM where there were nine aircrafts, uh, aircraft uh, at this particular airport. No movements during the night. And on this picture below, uh, we have uh, collected the data from Serving and Mapping Authority of the Republic of Slovenia. They have a building cadaster data and real estate register, which helped us uh, obtain purposes of use for each building around the airport. These small dots, you may not see them clearly, but they represent uh, buildings, and this is the airport. So why we needed this? Uh, because uh, we had only had the movements of people from one municipality to another based on the survey. So we didn't know actually to which uh, cell they will, they will go to, to, to each building. So we used uh, an algorithm to assess the probability for each person going to each uh, cell, which we used uh, 500 by 500 meters and uh, calculated the number of buildings in each cell based on their purposes. So we had uh, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, um, uh, residential locations, leisure uh, locations for leisure activities and so on and so on. So uh, this is actually the daily passenger mobility survey that we have collected from statistical office of the Republic of Slovenia. The data were collected during the last two weeks in September and October 2017 uh, with equal distribution of working, non working days and actually the Persons involved in this survey were residents age 15 to 84. Uh, there were 8,842 participants. Uh, these were all microdata. What that means? The, uh, it means that we have obtained from the statistical office detailed data about every and each movement of these people on a selected day. So they ask, ask them, for example, how many trips did you have this day? And where did you go from which municipality? This when you uh, started your trip, what was the purpose of the trip? And from that uh, data, we have concluded that 15.3% of the survey participants actually stayed at home, what this means for our study. It means that actually for them, for 15% of the people, the noise impact will be the same uh, regardless of whether we include the dynamic noise maps or traditional noise maps, because they are actually staying at home. But for the other 7,487 persons, uh, Will make a difference and they uh, had 3.2 trips per day in average with these seven different trip purposes so some of them went to work uh, some of them are doing some business trips or going to school faculty uh, picking up a child accompanying a child or other person so visiting friends or going on some health treatment services and we use these uh, purposes to match the buildings that they will most probably uh, went and these were the times or peaks for different, um, different uh, purposes of trips. So you can see here as expected that people in Slovenia usually go to work around 7 a.m. And then in 4 p.m., some of them probably return to home and some of them probably go to the second shift. So these are the peaks for work uh, purposes. Also, we have done that for educational purposes where this se second peak is uh, slightly shift to the left, so around two or three p.m. when uh, pupils go to school uh, and shopping activities usually had a peak around 11 uh, a.m. while leisure activities uh, had peak uh, after 6 uh, p.m. after the people are coming back from home. So these are our input data regarding the mobility and we are now here at the results. So what uh, have we looking here? We are looking at the L-band noise contours and people affected by aircraft noise. Let me show you uh, this uh, legend here, that actually we have four different types of persons. We can say that these white locations represent the people that are actually living within the aircraft uh, noise contours of 37 dBs. As I said, that this is the threshold for the annoyance. 
So even though uh, they are living within the noise contours, they are moving away uh, for their work or school, away from the noise contours. And actually then 0.1% uh, of them are not annoyed by noise, even though in the traditional noise maps, you would get result that they are. So that basically means if we do the traditional noise maps and uh, say that there are 1,000 people annoyed by noise, actually 100 of them will not be annoyed. On the other hand, which in traditional noise maps we do not uh, include are these yellow uh, points. These are the people living outside the noise contours, but actually traveling to some locations within the noise contours. And there, therefore, their noise impact has been increased. So we have 14.4% of uh, percentage of people living outside the L band 37 decibel noise contours that are annoyed by aircraft noise. And consequently, uh, the two other types of persons are red and uh, uh, gray, which means that there are persons living inside and also affected, which means they are not moving that much away from the noise contours. And opposite of that, uh, this is a map of the whole Slovenia. So there are quite uh, far away locations where people do not enter nowhere near the airport, so they are not annoyed by noise. And uh, the same results could be seen in this table, but actually what I want to show you here is that, uh, as you can imagine, some of them are going outside the noise contours, some of them are going inside. So when you combine all of that, you actually do not get that different results from the reference scenario and dynamic. Only 2.9% of the people are more annoyed by noise when we include dynamic noise scenario. But what actually changed is the number of highly annoyed people where we have 10% decrease. And for the sleep disturbed uh, persons, nothing has changed. This is uh, due to uh, low uh, frequency of uh, uh, night movements, population not moving that much during the night. So the impact is quite uh, similar. On this last slide, you can see as, uh, as I showed on previous slide that some of them living uh, inside the noise contours, but moving away are actually, for them, the noise impact has been overestimated. They are not that uh, annoyed. And consequently, on the other hand, uh, uh, if the person is living outside, but travels inside the noise contours, for, for those kind of persons, the noise impact has been underestimated. And to conclude, uh, we showed that the number of people annoyed by noise increases by 2.9% compared to the reference scenario, but highly annoyed per, uh, people decreases by 10%. And for some of them, the noise impact has been overestimated, for some of them underestimated. And for those who, who stayed at home for the whole day, uh, it's the same actually. Sleep disturbance indicators do not differ significantly between these two scenarios. And uh, as I showed, some of them uh, uh, are not annoyed as we think they are, and the other ones are annoyed even though we don't actually see that from the traditional noise controls. So what are our future uh, uh, research? These results must be validated. In urban areas that are more diverse in terms of land use, and uh, by this we mean that we need to include more airports to see uh, the areas around the airport for different cities because the different cities have different land use and we assume that their daily mobility patterns will change and uh, hence we will get different results. Also, since we uh, only looked at the 8,000 uh, persons uh, participating in this survey, we need uh, to widen our sample of population to prevent uncertainty in the metrics. So I will conclude with this. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And the, these are my contact details. If you would like, uh, uh, you can send me an email. Of course, you can send uh, qu now in the Q&A session your questions. And Dirk, if I have maybe just one more minute, I would like to show you additional slides. Uh, uh, one minute slideshow. This is actually, uh, this is an actually noise contour per hour, which means that here you have the noise contours for from uh, midnight to 1 a.m. and the people were actually there currently. And then if we look to 3, 4 a.m., we can see that the traffic is changing, growing, and also the people are moving from one location to another. And uh, this is actually uh, the calculation behind this, this, research, this research. So uh, that is all that I wanted to show you from this presentation. I will go back to the...
this slide and thank you for your attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Emir, for this uh, interesting presentation, which I enjoyed a lot. I have a bunch of questions. Uh, we have a few in the Q&A stack, um, but uh, let me get you started um, with the following. You, you, you were using a survey in order to elicit the movement of people, but also their sensitivity to, uh, to the noise exposure. Now, I have two questions related to that. The first one is, um, do we actually want to know how sensitive people are to the no noise exposure? Um, should we treat the complainers in a different way than we should treat the people who are less uh, sensitive to, uh, to noise? That's a, almost a philosophical question, I guess. Um, and the second um, observation is, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, we could model the mobility of people with other means than, uh, than a survey, because a survey, of course, is very cumbersome. And I know that, for example, in the UK and in Spain, attempts have been made to model mobility uh, around airports um, using mobile phone records. Is that something that you could consider using as well? Thank you, Dick, for uh, these questions. Uh, I will start by the second question because I already mentioned in the our uh, in this presentation that uh, there are ways uh, to use the mobile phone data, and we are actually doing this uh, currently. So you can expect maybe for the next Cesar Innovation Days results regarding the, the mobile phone data. Uh, and the first question is, but let me say just about the mobile data. Uh, mobile phone data, they are quite expensive and hard to get due to the GDPR regulation, general uh, data uh, public regulation, something like that. So um, it's hard to get. And uh, regarding the first question, yes, uh, we should include also how sensitive people are, and then we are going into more details. So for this, for example, study, I believe that we do not have a way how to include that right now for the whole population, for the synthetic population. Maybe we could, I think that that is uh, incorporated into this uh, European Commission uh, annoyance equation, because you have a population and uh, um, some of them are more annoyed by noise, some of them are less annoyed by noise. But when you have a whole population and do a survey, you get a percentage of people annoyed by noise. Uh, and th that's uh, this equation that I have shown. So for example, if we have 100 persons and we have uh, L then 60 decibels, I count that not all of them are annoyed by noise. So I only use maybe 20, 30% of them based on that noise level. I don't, I'm not sure if I under, uh, respond to your question well, but uh, that's how we can uh, introduce annoyance. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Paul Nearing, um, who asks, um, may, maybe this can be solved with a mobile phone record if you if you go down that route, but he, uh, he mentions that the uh, patterns of the population movements may be very different on different days. And uh, are you able to capture that in, in the survey? You might move differently on the weekend than uh, during the week and, and so on. Uh, if you've seen my slide, uh, I, I suppose there is no need to share a slide again, but uh, as I said in the daily mobility survey uh, that we have collected from the Statistical Office of the Republic of Slovenia, they have uh, watched uh, precisely to uh, pro provide equal uh, number of days in the week. So they have asked people in, on Monday, how do you travel? Then on Tuesday, then on Sunday. So we have equal distribution of all days. And since uh, this uh, survey has been conducted in September and October during the time period where there are no holidays and uh, when the uh, pupils and students go to their faculties, so everything is, uh, uh, there are no severe weather conditions. Uh, we assume that these kind of movements are good and representative for the whole year. So uh, what we actually did in this study, we used like some average uh, daily mobility patterns because people are moving differently every day and you cannot uh, have this precise data. But for example, if I live in one part of the city and work in another part of the city, probably for as an average travel, I will go each day in average from that location to that location during my working hours. So we wanted to, uh, to only capture that kind of movements which are stable. But if you want to look at in, the, in the precise day, each when one of us goes to the holidays, we're not in the country. So, but in average, this is the movements for the population. 
Okay, you mentioned on your last slide actually uh, future work and you mentioned that you wanted to apply your approach to other airports than just Ljubljana. Uh, perhaps larger airports, maybe you're gonna, you're gonna tell us which ones th those are, but uh, you will be uh, compelled to repeat your survey on, the, on those airports and maybe the, there is a much larger uh, population uh, living around these airports. Can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, future work of yours? Uh, that's that's true. Uh, within the Anima project, uh, our plan is to, uh, and we have already started doing the noise maps, dynamic noise maps for uh, Heathrow Airport, which is the, the busiest airport in Europe. And uh, also London is a city that has uh, uh, more citizens uh, than Slovenia, Serbia, and a uh, couple of countries <laughs> around. So uh, that would be a huge challenge, uh, but uh, would, which is good is that uh, what is good is that uh, in uh, in UK there are uh, national travel surveys done by each year, so we have a good data about the, and we will use it uh, to estimate the daily mobility populations around uh, London, and uh, Open Sky will provide us with data uh, for the um, movement patterns of the aircraft. So we'll, I assume that we will have everything for that airport. And also, uh, since the Uganda airport can be considered as a small airport, Heathrow can be considered as the biggest, we would like to do some uh, medium-sized airport in between and to see, uh, to compare the difference with these three case studies. That is our for, for future research. Excellent. There's uh, one question from Sonar Nimirel, uh, who asked how many level of uh, holding occurred during the approach. I, I assume in Ljubljana, you don't have a whole lot of holding uh, patterns uh, in, the, in daily operations. No, actually we didn't include uh, in, in our modeling, uh, we didn't include it at all. If there are some, probably they're neglected. So we didn't use that in the noise modeling software. Okay, um, another question. May in Ireland is cold and the windows are closed compared to Belgrade the same month. This has an effect on noise avoidance. Is it possible to incorporate that in your model? Would, you, would that be due, due to the uh, annoyance sensitivity in the, in the questionnaire or are there other ways in which you could in, incorporate such effects? Uh, it can be it can be included. Uh, actually, I think that one uh, part of the Anima team is doing this uh, in the uh, application that it's possible to select a part of the around the city that actually has some good isolation of the windows. And if you uh, input that, uh, provide that as an input to the model, you can uh, estimate different uh, noise levels compared to whether the windows is opened or closed. So you it can be done. Uh, okay. But uh, what I see, the problem is here, uh, it should be an average if we want to calculate for the whole year. So in May it's opened, in the, it's not open, so that could be maybe a problem to, to do an average. Uh, so you should hook up with Antonio and get a, a weather en ensemble uh, now cast and uh, make the, uh, the dynamic noise map dependent on the actual weather. Um, what are the practical um, the next steps, the practical implementation of dynamic noise maps are, is legislation considering, uh, airports considering uh, changing their approach in order to uh, include this uh, dynamic aspect of uh, noise annoyance? Actually, there are no current plans as I know because this topic is quite new. I have obtained my PhD in 2018 uh, on this and from 2018 up to now, there are no papers published on this, uh, on this uh, topic. I know some of my colleagues are uh, creating uh, MATSIM uh, models for different cities in the world. And uh, if uh, that uh, trend uh, continues, we will have uh, nice uh, models for each and every city in the world about the movements of the people. So if we have that, uh, the future of this is quite good because then we'll, we can just import that as uh, we import the population and it will be quite easy to calculate the dynamic noise map for every city. If we need to start from the scratch for each and airport, that could uh, be a burden for, for this idea because it's quite time consuming to, to create daily population mobility for, for different cities. I guess it would. 
Excellent. Uh, that, well, that brings us to the end of uh, the time slot allocated to you. Um, thank you for all questions. Emir, thank you very much for this presentation and thank you for uh, answering uh, the questions. There are a few more questions in the Q&A stack and if you stick around a little while longer, you can, uh, you can answer them also uh, in writing. And uh, I also encourage Antonio to do that if, if there's anything left over from his stack. I think he's cleaned it up uh, nicely. Um, but you can maybe you can take some time, Emir, and, and answer some of the questions uh, life that I didn't uh, pick. And uh, that would bring us to the uh, last presentation. Uh, and the presentation will be given by Eulalia Hernandez Romero, who is uh, an uh, old colleague, or an old colleague, no, a young colleague, a young ex colleague uh, of Antonio and um, Damir and. Uh, and, and um, uh, other people who work uh, at the University of Seville. And um, she has quite recently um, moved to Linköping University just a few weeks ago, to, just to confuse us with her affiliation. The work that she's um, presenting here, Strategic and Probabilistic Aircraft Conflict Detection and Resolution for Three-Dimensional Trajectories, however, uh, has been performed uh, still at the University of Seville. And I understand that um, the um, presentation will be uh, pre-recorded and uh, we will come to a Q&A uh, session afterwards. So can we have the video, please? Hello, this is Eulalia Hernandez Romero. I will be presenting today the work of Alfonso Valenzuela, Damien Rivas and I, which is titled Strategic and Probabilistic Aircraft Crossing Detection Resolution for Three-Dimensional Trajectories. So uh, this is an overview of the presentation I'm going to be making today. I will start with an introduction where I will state the motivations behind the work and some of the objectives. I will continue giving some definitions on a section on probabilistic conflict detection and resolution. On section three, I will talk about the actual problem formulation. I will describe the assumption that, that we used and also describe the methodologies. I will continue with a section on results. And finally, I'll conclude the summary conclusions and, and further work. So let us start with an introduction. Uh, conflict detection and resolution is a task that's performed by air traffic controllers and is essential to ensure the safety of aircraft operations. Being able to identify and solve conflicts early in advance has several advantages. For example, it allows for devising efficient resolution maneuvers and also reduces the tactical workload of air traffic controllers. However, um, this means that we will have to look at large look ahead time horizons, which translates in high levels of uncertainty in the trajectory prediction. That's why strategic conflict detection methodologies must manage and integrate the uncertainty present in the air traffic management system. As we know, there are several sources of uncertainty that can affect the ATN system, for example, uncertainty in data or in the decisions taken by humans. But one source of uncertainty that's particularly important and this is the one that we're going to consider in this work, is weather uncertainty. So our main objective is to propose probabilistic methodologies for a strategic conflict detection or resolution considering weather uncertainties. Um, the two partial tasks are first to develop a probabilistic conflict detection methodology for a conflict scenario of hundreds of aircraft flying three-dimensional trajectories. In these methodologies, we're going to consider both wind and temperature uncertainties, and we're going to develop a probabilistic trajectory predictor that is able to predict the trajectories and the conf conflict with a time horizon of 60 minutes. And second, we want to develop a probabilistic conflict resolution methodology, which is going to be based on meta heuristics, and it's aimed to lower the probability of conflict below a safety threshold and also to minimize the deviation from the nominal trajectories. So let's give some definitions. What is a conflict between two aircraft? Well, we can see that a conflict between two aircraft exists when a set of separation minima is predicted to be violated in the future. Another way to look at it is to say that the aircraft are surrounded by a protected zone, which is defined by a horizontal separation requirement D and a vertical separation requirement H. So if these protected zones are predicted to overlap in the future, we can say that the aircraft are in conflict. 
in order to characterize the conflict, we define uh, this variable over here, which is the distance of closest approach between the two aircraft. This is the uh, minimum distance that's ever going to be between the aircraft, and it's computed using this equation over here. It is the minimum over time of the maximum of these two terms. This, the first term is the normalized horizontal distance between the aircraft, and the second term is the normalized vertical distance between the aircraft. And then we can say that the aircraft are in conflict if the distance of closest approach between them is less than one. So in a probabilistic setting, the aircraft trajectories will be uncertain, and so there will the uh, functions that define the horizontal distance between the aircraft and the vertical distance. That's why a distance of closest approach, now we have to consider that is a random variable, and also we have to give a probability of conflict. So we define the probability of conflict as the probability of the distance of, process of, of closest approach being less than one. So summation is important to understand that um, the trajectories of the aircraft are going to be uncertain, and here we're going to try to see how weather uncertainty affects trajectory prediction. This figure over here, we, ha we have the um, velocity triangle of one aircraft that's flying with a given course and a given airspeed. And the two sources of uncertainty that we're going to consider in this work are first the horizontal wind components. We are not going to consider vertical winds. And all the second source of uncertainty will be the air temperature. On the one hand, the wind uncertainty affects the value of the aircraft ground speed because the aircraft ground speed is defined as the sum of the aircraft airspeed and the wind velocity. And we can see that if the wind is uncertain, so the aircraft ground speed will also be uncertain. And on the other hand, the temperature, the temperature uncertainty can affect the value of the aircraft airspeed. For example, if the aircraft is flying with a given Mach number, we can clearly see how the um, air value of the aircraft airspeed is affected by the temperature. So in order to capture the uncertainty that the weather um, propagates into the uh, trajectory prediction, we have to use a probabilistic trajectory predictor, which is going to uh, use the probabilistic, probabilistic weather data and obtain a probabilistic trajectory. So let's talk a little bit about the probabilistic weather. In this work, we are uh, using probabilistic weather forecasting, and in particular, we're using a technique which is ensemble prediction systems. An ensemble prediction system is a collection of forecasts that's uh, called members that constitute as a representative sample of the potential states of the weather outcome. An ensemble prediction system is constructed by repeatedly running a numerical weather model from slightly different initial positions or also maybe uh, with different parameterizations of the atmosphere. In order to obtain um, a collection, a set of forecasts, an ensemble of forecasts, which aim is to capture the, um, the forecast uncertainty. And the final aim is that the true final state of the atmosphere falls within the forecast uncertainty that described by the ensemble prediction system. In order to use ensemble prediction systems for trajectory prediction, we use an ensemble approach. Using this approach for each one of the members of the ensemble prediction system, we will run a deterministic trajectory predictor in order to obtain an ensemble of trajectories from which probabilistic information about the trajectory can be obtained. And let's talk a little bit of conflict resolution. So the general aim of conflict resolution is to, is to generate resolution trajectories uh, for all the aircraft, that is to, modi to modify their planned trajectories in order to, des to uh, solve the conflict that has been detected in the previous conflict detection phase. In particular, when we're talking about probabilistic conflict resolution, what we want to do is to obtain resolution trajectories that present a probability of conflict between any pair of aircraft that is smaller than a than a pre prescribed safety threshold. So let's talk a, a little bit about the problem, the particular problem that we have um, studied. So we have uh, a number of aircraft that fly in the same airspace. Their trajectories are going to be three dimensional and they are going to be described by waypoints, which are given by the aircraft flight plans. The aircraft trajectories are going, are going to be composed of straight segments and uh, turn segments, which are fly-by turns. The main assumptions that we consider are 
first the uh, aircraft are going to fly with either a given Mach number or a calibrated airspeed and a given rate of climb and, and descent. These values are going to be dependent on the altitude and they are going to be given by an operational procedure. This means that these values are going to be certain and known. Also, the initial positions of the aircraft are going to be also certain and known. And as I said earlier, the uh, uh, weather uncertainty is going to come from um, uncertainty in the horizontal wind and the temperature, and it's going to be provided by EPS. The turns are going to be performed at constant radius, and there are no turns at the origin and destination waypoints of the trajectories. So, uh, as I mentioned, the wind and temperature uncertainty are going to be provided by EPS. This means that they are going to be dependent on both time and location, and they are also giving, uh, they are also going to be given by aggregated forecast data. These are the equations of motion for each one of the aircraft, and what I want you to see is that in these equations, the uh, aircraft ground speed. Um, is present and as we mentioned earlier this ground speed is going to be affected by both the wind and the temperature uncertainties. So what we do in sample trajectory prediction is uh, a differential equations are going to be integrated for each one of the M members of the ensemble in order to obtain an ensemble of trajectories. And as an example of this ensemble of trajectories is depicted in here. We have depicted the time of advance and delay with respect to the average value of a given trajectory. And we can clearly see how the uncertain grows over time. So in order to compute the conflict between two aircraft, we follow a three-step method. Um, first, uh, for each one of the members on the ensemble, for two aircraft, we are going to compute the distance of closest approach between the two aircraft uh, with the equation that uh, I described in, in the previous section. A second step would be to determine if uh, in that um, member of the ensemble there is a conflict between the two. So what we do is for each member of the ensemble, we compare the uh, computed distance of closest approach with one in order to determine whether there is a conflict or not in that member of the ensemble. And finally, the third step is that we consider that the, all, the mem all members are equally probable. So finally, the probability of conflict between the two aircraft is computed as the fraction of members for which a conflict is identified with this simple equation over here. So we do this for each pair of aircraft. And if we're working with hundreds of aircraft, we're going to have a lot of pairwise computations. In order to reduce the number of pairwise computations, we use a conflict detection grid-based approach. What we do here is for each member of the trajectory ensemble, we discretize the trajectory and store it into the selves of a four-dimensional grid. So we will have as many four-dimensional grids as members of the ensemble are. And then the conflict between two aircraft is only computed if the assigned cells for those trajectories are either adjacent or coincident. This means that aircraft that are too far apart, either in space or in time, are not going to be in conflict and that, that pairwise computation is not uh, going to be computed. Uh, as you can imagine, these four dimensional grids are very large, so uh, we have been able to reduce uh, the computational effort, but at the expense of an increase um, a requirement of computer memory. So in order to store these four-dimensional grids efficiently, we use um, a, a kind of file which is a hash, ta a hash table, which um, using this method over here, we can reduce the required computer memory because the um, empty cells do not occupy any memory. And now about the conflict resolution problem, we are going to treat the conflict resolution problem as a nonlinear programming problem subject to inequality constraints. This is the problem that we have in hand. We have to minimize a cons function subject to given constraints. First, uh, let's talk about the three param parameters. The conflict resolution uh, um, strategy is going to be vectoring. That, that means that we're going to um, alter the the coordinates of the trajectory waypoints. So the three parameters of this uh, nonlinear programming problem will be the coordinates of the trajectory waypoints. We consider that the first and last waypoint of the trajectory remain unchanged. The objective function uh, of our problem, we have 
three terms. The first term could be to minimize the deviation of the resolution trajectories from the nominal ones, because we consider that the nominal trajectories are the preferred trajectories of the aircraft and has already been optimized by some kind of individual criteria. The second type of the objective function would be the actual probabilistic conflict resolution. Um, the actual probability conflict resolution we would be uh, to minimize the probabilities of conflict. And finally, the third term, that a little bit of an artificial term, is going to consider that only those conflicts that we consider to be strategic are going to be tackled by the methodology. I will explain what a tactical conflict is uh, in a moment. And finally, the constraints. We have considered two constraints, which are first the minimum segment length. This means that the Long, uh, the, the length of the segments between two consecutive waypoints must be large enough to accommodate the safe turns on those waypoints. And the second constraint is the maximum uh, lateral deviation. And this means that the uh, waypoints of the resolution trajectory must not be too far apart for the nominal ones. In order to solve this conflict, because we have hundreds of aircraft and each aircraft trajectory has those sets of waypoints, we have a lot of uh, free parameters. So a, a meta-heuristic technique is probably particularly suitable for this kind of problems. So we're using meta-heuristics and in particular, we're using the simulated annealing algorithm. So let's give a look to the results. So the probabilistic weather data that we have used for this particular application is obtained from the ensemble predictor system COSMO D2 EPS, which has 20 members and is produced by the German Weather Service. It has a fine horizontal resolution and several atmosphere levels. And we're using this particular um, ensemble. In this figure over here, we can see the area of the, of the, the coverage area of the ensemble. And uh, in this figure, we have depicted the, sonal, the average value of the sonal wind. And in here we can see the dispersion. We can see that in some areas is as high as 18 meters per second, which is quite significant. And this is the conflict scenario that we have considered. We have 822 aircraft in total. This is the traffic that's flying uh, over Euro's airspace uh, over a flight level of uh, flight level of um, 100. Uh, in this particular day, we are not going to consider the aircraft that fly uh, below flight level 100. The, fl the flight planes data are obtained from uh, Eurocontrol's uh, demand data repository, and the aircraft operational procedures, that is the Mach number, the calibrated airspeed, and the rate of climbs of descents, are obtained from the base of aircraft data. The conflict resolution parameters for the minimum separation are 500 miles for the horizontal separation requirement and 1,000 feet for the vertical separation requirement. And the probability of conflicts threshold we have set to 50%. This probability threshold allows us to uh, define three different kinds of conflicts. First, we have low probability conflicts that are those conflicts which have probability of conflict lower than 50%. Then we have high probability conflict, which with a probability of conflict higher than uh, 50%. And finally, we have tactical conflicts. These conflicts are uh, aircraft that are in loss of separation at the beginning. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we are considering a strategic conflict resolution. And this conflict that at this starting time are already in loss of separation, we consider that they should be uh, solved using tactical um, strategies. So they are not going to be the focus of our conflict resolution methodology. So the, conflict, the strategic conflict resolution methodology that we propose is going to try to um, minimize the number of high probability conflicts. So this is an example of what the conflict resolution methodology do to, does to aircraft trajectories. We have shown two aircraft, A and B. Um, in this figure, we can see the nominal trajectories of the aircraft the, uh, depicted with dotted points and the trajectories after the conflict resolution depicted with solid lines. And we can see that the aircraft B maneuvers to allow the safe separation between the aircraft. In this figure over here, we see the normalized distance between the two aircraft. The, uh, in blue lines, we can see the <clears throat> distance between the aircraft before the conflict resolution. And we can see that all of the lines fall below the red line at one. This means that before the conflict resolution, the probability of conflict is 100%. 
After the conflict resolution, the basically with orange lines, you can see that some of the lines fall below uh, the threshold one, but most of them don't. So uh, after the conflict resolution, we have a probability of conflict of 45%, which means which is less than the threshold of 50%. So this means that the conflict related to these two particular aircraft has been solved. So this is the, re the results for all the aircraft. Uh, we have before the conflict resolution, we have in here shown the uh, horizontal profiles and here the vertical profiles. With blue dots, we have this uh, depicted the low probability conflicts. With red dots, we have the high probability conflicts if, and with orange dots, the uh, tactical conflicts. This is before the conflict resolution and after the conflict resolution, we can see that the number of high probability conflicts has significantly uh, decreased. In particular, in this figure over here, we can see the total number of conflicts that has low uh, has go from 185 to 146. But what is most important about this figure over here is that we can see that the number of high probability conflicts has dropped from 131 to only 14. The number of tactical conflicts um, remains the same at 25, and we can see that the number of low probability conflict has increased from uh, before the conflict resolution to after the conflict resolution, and this that this is because some of the conflicts that were high probability conflicts before the resolution, com the conflict resolution, are now low probability conflicts. So let's uh, summarize. Uh, we have been able to um, uh, develop a methodology that allows the statistical characterization of the conflicts and is capable of generating resolution trajectories that lower the probability of conflict below acceptable levels. Uh, the proposed strategic conflict detection methodology is able to predict the probability of conflict between the, the aircraft, considering within temperature uncertainties, three dimensional trajectories, a time horizon of 60 minutes, and hundreds of aircraft. And the conflict resolution uh, methodology has been uh, developed and successfully applied to a realistic scenario and has been shown to be able to significantly lower the number of high probability conflicts. So uh, the future of this research um, could be we would like to expand the methodology to include flights that are below flight level 100. This would mean that we will have to consider the uncertainty presence in the aircraft departure time. Another thing that we would also like to include is to extend the, uh, the coverage area of the methodology. This could involve the integration of both regional and global EPS. Another uh, future work worth considering could be to use alternative conflict resolution maneuvers, for example, speed changes or altitude changes. And finally, uh, what, one technique that could improve the scalability of our problem would be to use clustering techniques which uh, would allow us to uh, divide the whole problem into smaller, easier to solve sub-problems that could be also parallelizable. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you very much, Ilalia. Uh, we do indeed have a few questions. Uh, before we get into the questions, I'd like to make one, one remark. You've been using DDR uh, data sets, and I don't know if all of you have um, um, have seen that we have uh, launched something at Eurocontrol called the ATIM R&D Data Archive, where when you um, register, you have access to uh, to lots of data, so you don't have to requ request this data anymore. Uh, specifically, but you can, you just register, your registration is approved, and then you have access to, I think, four months of complete uh, radar and flight plan data per year up to two years ago. So the data is always two years old, but for most uh, research purposes that should suffice. So if you Google um, Eurocontrol uh, ATM R&D data archive, you should be able to, to come across that. Um, I'd like to kick off the questions with, uh, with a question concerning the the conflicts, you are you you were resolving most of the conflicts, but not all. And those who, which are remaining, uh, is there a common denominator? Which which type of conflicts are the ones that you are not able to resolve with your algorithm? Well, um, I would say that those conflicts are maybe uh, too severe. Um, the uh, the aircraft might be too close together to solve within the parameters. Of the of the conflict resolution uh, methodology, so um, 
In the conflict resolution optimization problem, we include some uh, restrictions. For example, the, the waypoints of the resolution trajectories can go too far apart from the nominal ones. So in order to solve those conflicts that are too severe, we either would have to increase those, um, those restrictions, but uh, what we would like to use to solve those conflicts actually is to uh, considering in the future some different resolution maneuvers, as someone uh, mentioned in the in the questions, like a speed uh, changes would be interesting, and of course altitude changes, which are the conflict resolution maneuver that usually prefer. So uh, yeah, those kind of conflicts that are too severe to be solved with our proposed methodology would eventually have to be solved using other resolution trajectories. Okay, but the severity is not initially taken into consideration by your algorithm. It's just the probability, right? So uh, it depends on how you define severity. If you define severity as the uh, uh, as how close the aircraft are together at the point of closest approach, our algorithms only look at uh, the probability. And if those uh, conflicts are not solved, eventually our algorithm will take a look at those uh, conflicts closer. But no, the, the severity as a, an input is not considered just the probability of conflict. But again, they are very, uh, very relate, um, they're very related because uh, probably the uh, conflict that has a lot of severity will probably have a lot of uh, a higher probability of conflict. And is speed control a degree of freedom of your conflict resolution algorithm? No, no. So no right now, that's something that I would like to include in future steps, but it could be I don't think it would be difficult to include because we are using a parameterization of the trajectories. So in order to include uh, speed changes, that could be just an extra parameter to include in the optimization problem. So that's something that we'd like to explore in the future or that at least would be uh, very worth considering. Okay. Um, my colleague Meta wants to know what your specific reasoning was for using the 60 minute uh, uh, look ahead time. So uh, he has asked why not use a lower one, like for example, 30 minutes. I mean, we could. And uh, actually, we solved the, the, the conflicts for up to 60 minutes. So, conflicts that take place at 30 or 15 are also solved. So for the 60 minutes look ahead time horizon, we um, the reasoning was that those um, trajectories, those conflicts are gonna have a higher uncertainty the longer we look into the future. And because we have different, um, be because we, if we look too far ahead, those uncertainties could be mm, very great. A 60 minute time horizon seemed uh, reasonable. I cannot give you like a given data or a given uh, particular reasoning behind why 60 minutes exactly, but uh, yeah, a lower where uh, time horizon could also be considered without problem. Okay, can follow us up on the previous question concerning speed. It says it would be interesting to model aircraft flying at constant cost index rather than constant CAS or Mach. But I guess that's an initiation to, uh, to, to integrate that into future work, perhaps if, if you find that interesting. Yeah, I mean, well. mm -hmm. it could be possible, yeah. Okay, question from Sonar. Did you use experimental design for SA algorithm parameters? Also, how much percentage the SA approaches to the optimum solution in small data set? I haven't. <laughs> that's the question, no. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, that's, <laughs> that's, a quick, that's a quick answer. <laughs> yeah. That keeps us on time, and uh, it seems we're running out of time. I um I have one one question that I'd like personally to answer. You you uh, gave us a bit of insight into your conflict re resolution algorithm, but not so much on the TP you're using. Can you can you tell us a little bit about the TP? Yeah, well, it's actually super simple. Uh, we use an a regular um, trajectory predictor, so the the 
I, I don't remember if in the, in the presentation I had like the equations. So what we do is for each member of the, mem of, of the weather ensemble, we uh, integrate the, the um, uh, equations of motion of the aircraft, like we could do, we could do in a deterministic trajectory predictor. And then uh, we, what we obtain is an ensemble of trajectories. So from that ensemble, uh, we can obtain the, um, yeah, the, the probabilistic information about the, the trajectory. So it's okay. actually, uh, it's, I think it's a very simple approach in the terms that, uh, I mean, we don't obtain like a probability, a probability density function of the, of, for example, the times at where at aircraft arrives at a given waypoint, but we are, I mean, uh, we are able to give an idea of the spread of the trajectories. And yeah, it's, I would say that's I, the, the easiest way to solve this problem with this particular information. Considering that you are a, a, a former colleague of Antonio, I was actually expecting you to use lots of uh, similar approaches or use the same model or the same ensemble or the same trajectory prediction or the same uh, conflict avoidance maneuver, but I was disappointed that seems not to be the case. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I learned uh, uh, probably some things could be, could be just similar because I learned a lot from Antonio, but yeah. Excellent. Well, I think this brings us to the end of our session. And I'd like to thank all three speakers again for, for these interesting presentations, which I in, enjoyed very much. And um, I will close this session now and I will see you all again tomorrow morning, I think at uh, 10 o'clock. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. The Mexis concept consists of three main steps. In the first step, drones that are already flying around measure the instantaneous wind around them and transmit this data to a ground station. In the second step, the ground station uses a technique known as the Meteor Particle Model to estimate the 3D wind field around all the drones in real time. This technique was recently invented at TU Delft. It estimates the wind vector at each point in a predefined grid as the weighted average of all the wind measurements near that grid point. The estimate is updated as soon as a new measurement point is received from the drone. In this project, we'll be applying the MPM technique for the first time to drones. In the third and final step, the estimated 3D wind field is transmitted to drone operators via the u space Weather Information Service in real time. Drone operators can use this information for planning their flights before takeoff or to adjust the routes of drones that are already flying. 